Imagine if billions of dollars were sitting in a bank account, and that bank account was in one of the most dysfunctional countries in the world. Sooner or later, someone would want to steal them. And sooner or later, someone did. This is kind of high-level financial corruption. This is the story of the biggest bank heist in history. For months, The Economist Middle East correspondent Nicholas Pelham has been following the trail to figure out how the cash was stolen. It was done without sawn off shotguns, without balaclavas. This was the ultimate inside job. And who did it? This is a very serious crime by very powerful people. In August 2022, this man, Hussein Kanbar Agha, received a phone call which would change his life. From the finance minister of Iraq. He said that he was hearing rumors that about 800 billion Iraqi dinars were stolen from the tax authority. 800 billion Iraqi dinars is what? It's about sort of 600... 600 million, million dollars. dollars. Yeah. Hussein Kanbar fled Iraq in 1992, after Saddam Hussein's thugs detained him at a checkpoint. He moved to Sweden, but he continued to have dealings in Iraq, and knew the finance minister. He said, I think you should come to Baghdad and support us in this investigation. I felt it had to be done. Kanbar suggested a team was discreetly formed, made up of accountants and lawyers. Together, they set to work. The first day we met, we briefed the committee what we want to do to figure out what's going on. I mean, you have the bank statement, it's a quite heavy, thick document. You just see the opening balance and the closing balance. And then you see that there are 3.7 something trillion Iraqi dinars missing. 2.5 billion dollars. Exactly. The people around the table, they were like shocked. The missing billions came from an account which contained unclaimed rebates. Companies working in Iraq have to pay tax in advance when they receive a contract, which is kept in this specific account. If companies make less profit than they expected, they can claim a rebate. But in practice, there is so much bureaucracy, this doesn't always happen. So for years, this money had just sat there, alluringly. Kanbar and the team started to make calls. During that period, it's, it's really like watching one of these uh, sick Tarantino movies. And you don't want to see, but you keep watching because you want to see what's the end of it. So this was one of the checks. One of the perpetrators, they took the check to Rafidain Bank. What Rafidain Bank does in that case they write a letter to the tax authority to make sure that the check is authentic. It was, and it wasn't the only one. Kanbar and the team dug deeper and found that 247 checks had been written in the space of a single year, all to just five companies. No one had heard of these companies before. Three of them had been registered just before the transfers began. It seemed three businessmen were beneficiaries of the money in the tax authority's account. But there was one in particular that people would soon be talking about. Noor Zahir. Noor Zahir himself is a kind of rather unassuming character. He's in his early 40s, he's kind of quite chubby. He has this remarkable knack of winning people over and doing it with the suggestion of perhaps they take a watch, perhaps they then take money, of sort of easing people into a system of corruption. But just from the sheer complexity of the heist, it became clear that this wasn't the work of one man. So I decided to go around Baghdad to find out more. I'm standing outside the uh, General Commission for Taxes. It was from here that authorization came for Noor Zohair and his accomplices to receive $2.5 billion. It was surprisingly easy to get into the tax authority. I was ushered into one office on the fifth floor and I kept asking about how could this heist have happened. As I was leaving, kind of one man took me aside and said, you know, you just walked through the same entrance that Noor's hair came in. He described how 
uh, his limousine would park at the steps of the tax authority, how he would leave his uh, security escort on the ground floor and how he'd just sort of march into any room that he wanted. He would make the request for a repayment, supposedly on behalf of one of the companies, but in practice, fictitiously. To issue large cheques from the tax authority, you needed the signatures of at least 12 different officials, a process which could take weeks. But Noor Zahair managed to get the cheques much quicker. In the background, you'll see that building with the red facade. That's the, uh, the Rafidane Bank, and that was really the nucleus of the heist of the century. It was from here that the dinars for came from the tax authority and were transferred to the Rafidane Bank and from there on to the beneficiaries. Iraq's bureaucracy is just really plodding. It's, it's still a, a cash economy. It hasn't been digitalized. And in comes Norzo here, and he decides that he's going to turn it into a model of efficiency. He gets everybody uh, sort of rushing to turn around checks in 24 hours. He gets money into the system and out of the system within the same period of time. He has kind of everybody at his beck and call, partly because he's paid them off, partly because they're terrified of him. But making off with $2.5 billion in cash was something of a logistical challenge. The highest value banknote in Iraq was the 50,000 dinar bill which was worth about $35. If all the stolen notes had been stacked on top of each other, the pile would have risen higher than Mount Kilimanjaro. Security vans would turn up at the backs of the banks, take the money, then be driven off to different safe houses and different zones in Baghdad. A lot of the money would then be transferred out of the country from Baghdad airport to different regional capitals. Money fanned out across Iraq and then across the region and perhaps even further afield. As Hussein Kanbar started to piece together the story, something didn't add up. You have $2.5 billion withdrawn in cash. So there must be somebody that counted it. There must be somebody that, you know, lifted it from the vaults of the bank to the cars. There must be guards around the bank. There's like an army of people that had to process these payments. I mean, here you have cars full of cash. In Iraq, I mean, you've been in Baghdad. There's checkpoint every, I don't know, in every street, right? Why did no one report it? Why did they accept it? I'm Jonathan Beckman, the editor of 1843 magazine, the economist's home of narrative journalism and the human stories behind the headlines. If you're enjoying this film, why not take out a subscription to The Economist? There, you can read more 1843 features, like our profile of the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, and our extensive coverage of the war in Ukraine. For the best offer, click on the link. Iraq looks like a functioning democracy. It has elections and an active parliament. But in reality, nothing in the country works as it should. And corruption is rife. There's different forms of corruption, right? So obviously you have petty corruption, doing everyday tasks. Bribes often help make things easier. But what's I think more significant is that grand corruption, that political corruption, which in essence is the political system. It stems back to some of the decisions made early on in 2003. You had these new leaders who all of a sudden found themselves in positions of power and they needed to keep that power. And corruption was an important mechanism to become powerful. They needed to get their hands on the incredible wealth of the state. And they needed to ensure that contracts and procurement went towards their interests. When you look at the story of this heist of the century, as Iraqis are calling it, you really begin to see that, that how the system works. Power in Iraq is shared between competing religious, ethnic and political groups, many of whom faced each other in a bloody civil war. Different government ministries are controlled by different groups. Most fall into two main camps, those aligned with the West and those aligned with Iran. At the time of the heist, the government in power was aligned with the West and led by Prime Minister Mustafa Kadami. But his government's power was crumbling. Waiting in the wings was the Iranian-backed Fatah Alliance. Fatah controlled the tax office at the heart of the investigation. 
So being publicly associated with the bank heist might discredit it and derail its efforts to take power. My impression at the outset was that this was the pro-American camp's attempt to try and embarrass the uh, pro-Iran camp and show that they were the kind of source of corruption, they were the source of the heist, that as so often in Iraq, an investigation into corruption isn't solely about trying to ensure good governance, it's about trying to undermine your opponents. The struggling government ensured the report into the heist was rushed out. أكثر من ملياري دولار من أموال الدولة تسرق قانونيا في العراق. Two weeks later, Noor Zahir was arrested as he tried to board a plane. But the efforts to undermine the pro-Iranian faction were to no avail. Within days, Prime Minister Kadmi had been toppled. The new pro-Iranian Prime Minister, Mohammad Sudani, was keen to demonstrate that his faction had nothing to hide. At a press conference flanked by what he claimed was some of the stolen cash, Sudani vowed to recover the rest of the money. But the stacks of cash made up just a small fraction of the missing billions. At the same time, Noor Zahir was abruptly released on bail. The explanation at the time by the judiciary and the government was that his release would help secure the funds that he squirreled away. But over time, you know, it, it didn't seem that he was going back into prison anytime soon. So it became clear quite quickly that this was a man that had protection at the highest level. It made want to know why. Noor Zahir told The Economist that he vehemently denied the allegations mentioned therein. I am a law-abiding citizen who never indulged in such type of crime. When asked why Noor Zahir had been released, a spokesman for Sudani told The Economist, The release of the accused Noor Zahir on bail was not a government decision, but it is the decision of the judge, and the charges were not dropped against him or those involved in this case. Nicholas contacted the judge overseeing the investigation, Thea Jahar Lafta. He's been widely perceived to be aligned with the pro-Iranian faction, although officials insist that Iraq's judiciary is independent. Not long after Zahir's release, the government changed course. The investigation seemed to shift dramatically from those who were accused of perpetrating the heist to those who had uncovered it. Officials issued arrest warrants for some of the senior figures involved in exposing Zahir. لا أعتقد أنه تتم من خلال موظف صغير مبلغ ثلاثة تريليون وستمية من تبحث في هذا الموضوع وتكون جاد بتشخيص التهمة أو الجريمة بشكل واضح تجد أن هناك تواضع حكومي واضح بكيفية توفير هذا المبلغ الكبير. The implication was that this collusion went right to the top of the previous regime. Former Prime Minister Mustafa Kadami and some of his allies fled to London. Barely a day went by without one member or other of the camp contacting me. They wanted to go on camera, they wanted to talk to me, they wanted to defend themselves, but they also wanted to show that they weren't involved, that there were others who were involved, and uh, this was a story that they felt could actually turn the tables in Iraq's political future. One, two, three. أنا أولا أجب أن أقول بكل صراحة أن ضميري مرتاح كشخص وكحكومة قامت بواجبها بكشف هذه الجريمة وجرائم أخرى الحكومة التي قدتها خلال سنة ونص هي أول حكومة عراقية منذ عام 2003 تقوم بإجراءات واضحة بملاحقة المجرمين 
أنا أقول لك بكل صراحة الحكومة قامت واجبها بكشف الجريمة وطلبنا بالتحقيق والبعض من قام بكشف هذه الجريمة تعرض للابتزاز وللضغوطات You had direct responsibility for the, for the airport A lot of the money disappeared through the airport At the very least should you not bear some of the responsibility for the disappearance of this ما كويس لا يوجد أي دليل على أن أموال هربت عن طريق المطار والتحقيقات أثبتت أن الأموال كانت موجودة في العراق وبأقارات تم شرائها في داخل العراق هذه فقط إشاعات تم ترويجها لشرطة الحكومة وشرطة بعض أطراف حكومتي The more people I talk to, the more allegations are being flung around It became harder and harder to discern who was clean and who was complicit Everyone seemed to have mud to fling at their um, uh, political enemies. Throughout his investigation, Nicholas talked to Iraqi politicians and officials from across the spectrum. He started to realize that underneath their furious opposition, they actually had a lot in common. They were part of the same Iraqi elite. They sent their kids to the same exclusive schools and mixed in similar circles. At some point, it dawned on me that this wasn't really a, a system of two camps. This was a system in which everybody was in on the make. It brought back memories of the uh, murder on the Orient Express, the story in which you know, everybody who was on that train carriage was complicit in the murder. And I thought somehow this was also now happening again in Iraq, in which all the factions which should have been protecting the country and serving the country were actually involved in fleecing it, tearing it apart. Many months on from the news of the heist breaking, it was still unclear how much of the stolen cash had been recovered and where the rest was. We've seen, what, two and a half billion dollars can leave government coffers. Where has that money gone? I think what we're seeing more and more is the money staying in Iraq, which means if you go to Baghdad today, you might see big developments. The question becomes, is this being redistributed across society? Or is this part of wider money laundering schemes, but we know that there's a lot of money in Iraq right now, a lot of money in Baghdad and other cities uh, being spent in infrastructure and, and, and these big, big sort of projects. The fact that it was harder to take all of that money out of the country meant that at least some of it had to stay in Iraq. And it's now a city which is on the move again. And at least some of that has got to be due to this heist of the century. It's not clear if there will ever be serious consequences for the key figures involved in the heist. Iraq's elite continue to squabble. And the rest of the money is still nowhere to be seen. To read my investigation into the bank heist, please click on the link. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>